Hello, and welcome to a very special podcast that is part of a series I'm leading on diversity, equity, and inclusivity with CME Outfitters. Today's CMEO podcast is entitled Health Inequities in Vision Care. Today's program is supported by an educational grant from Johnson & Johnson. I'm Dr. Monica Peake, and I'm a professor of medicine at the University of Chicago and the associate director at the Chicago Center for Diabetes Translational Research. I'm also the Executive Medical Director of Community Health Innovation and the Director of Research at the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics. I'd now like to welcome Dr. Adam Ramsey and Dr. Ruth Shogay. Dr. Ramsey is the Medical Director of Socialite Vision, the co-founder of Health Focus South Florida and the co-founder of Black Eye Care Perspective in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. Dr. Shogay is an Associate Clinical Professor and the Director of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging at the University of California, Berkeley, Herbert Wertheim School of Optometry and Vision Science in Berkeley, California. Adam and Ruth, I'm really honored to have you joining us today. I'm excited for our discussion. Thanks for having us. I really appreciate it. I'm excited. Yep, thank you. I want to remind our audience that this CMEO podcast is a continuation of our initiative to address unconscious bias, health disparities, and racial inequities. We're building a comprehensive library of educational activities addressing these important issues. And today's activity continues the discussion in vision care. The titles of the activities in this series are on the slides, and the links are in the images. Simply click on the images to review any of these programs. If you participate in at least three of the programs in our DNI Hub, you will also be eligible to receive a digital badge demonstrating your commitment to education on diversity, equity, and inclusivity. So let's get started. Our first learning objective for today's program is to analyze the influence of unconscious bias, health disparities, and health inequities on vision care. Now I'm gonna say that it would really be a disservice if we didn't take a moment to discuss how we got here. And as I had mentioned before, this is part of a comprehensive library. So we've covered these issues in detail, but I did wanna to touch on some foundational points regarding historical racism. We've done previous programs that specifically cover these topics in depth. And these programs, again, can be found on our DNI hub. But to just make sure that we've summarized and that we're all sort of level setting, we um, want to acknowledge that there are ingrained elements in our community around um, unequal access to housing, education, um, employment opportunities, what we call structural inequities um, that really affect people's um, life trajectory and their health. Um, some of these things have to do with basic uh, human rights like food, um, again, housing. Some of these issues have to do with what happens in the healthcare system where health providers have a bias. Um, some of these are environmental issues like the increased access um, or exposure to environmental toxins that are more likely to be in marginalized neighborhoods. All of these directly affects their um, access to healthcare. It affects their pathophysiology. Um, it affects how healthcare providers may or may not deviate from what we consider standards of care or SOC. And so we have to sort of um, recognize that there's a, a, a many, many levers that contribute um, to health disparities um, and have long-term impacts on people's health, um, how they engage in the healthcare system and how well we can or cannot retain them um, in not only self-management, but in healthcare delivery as well. So Ruth, let's start by focusing on inequitable factors in vision care. How might these disparities be demonstrated in your field? And are there any of these factors that are particularly important with regard to patients that you see? Yeah, thanks so much, Monica. So what, what we think about as in, inequitable factors in vision care, I think we could also term social determinants of health. I think that's maybe a terminology that people are more familiar with and hopefully more familiar with these days. And so it includes um, issues that you've kind of mentioned before as ingrained or structural elements, which include uh, one's economic stability, um, you know, the ability to pay for services, for example, one's environment, is it safe, is it healthy? Do they have um, good housing and transportation to meet their needs? Good education, literacy, um, access to different resources, updated and relevant resources, um, social access and um, healthcare as well, um, also being considered a, a determinant of health. And one that's uh, kind of new, but an important factor is technology. And I think 
we're only going to see more of technology, not less of technology, um, particularly going through and still dealing with some of the ramifications of uh, the pandemic, you know, really utilizing telemedicine as a way to access our patients and for them to access us and really being able to provide services in a, in a more expedient manner. So it's really hard to just pick one thing that's affecting eye care. They all work in congruence in affecting eye care and one's ability to access the healthcare system generally. And so um, probably top of mind for most people is do I have insurance to cover my vision exams and to also cover my glasses, which sometimes is not always part of the insurance package, or maybe you can get one pair of glasses every couple of years or so. So that's often a big hindrance, but I think maintaining communication, especially when we're taking care of patients who have chronic illness um, that manifests in eye care, are we communicating with the, their primary care doctor? More importantly, is their primary care doctor communicating with us so that continuity of care isn't broken? The patients are getting um, eye care needs in a um, timely fashion. So disease processes and other things that are not reversible keep them from getting worse. Um, so, I, you know, again, there's a lot of aspects that come together um, that influence vision care, this, the healthcare system generally, technology. I think we need to see more technology in eye care, um, in my opinion. And I'm excited about conversations that are happening around that area, as well as making sure that folks are getting the appropriate resources and education in a way that they can understand um, and value and know where their eye care needs fits into their general overall healthcare. Yes, I think it's really interesting that you mentioned technology because we are almost always sort of excited about new technologies and innovation. Um, and for me at an academic center, that is our bread and butter, like trying to be innovative. And one of the things I always say is that whenever we have something new, um, that creates opportunities for disparities because who is able to access these new technologies, these, this new innovation are uh, those who have um, all of the things that we were just talking about, more social capital, more economic um, opportunities. Um, and so technology is, it can move us forward, but it also can create worse disparities in any given disease. And so I'm glad to see that it's sort of uh, now sort of being mentioned as a determinant of health. All of the things that you mentioned, um, one of the drivers are structural racism that um, differentiates populations as far as who is more likely to be affected by housing insecurity or lack of access to technology, et cetera. So thank you so much. Can you talk about vision loss and what that does to impact our patients and the quality of life? I wanted to just, if I could, touch on one thing that you mentioned about technology and you're absolutely right that we're gonna to continue to see disparities even with the use of technology, equity is not at the center of innovation. And so without that equity at the center and creating technology that can actually reach the, reach the masses and not just people who can already afford these services that we're not really fixing the system, we're just continuing to add to a broken system. Yeah. So I wanted to just kind of respond to that, um, that technology piece specifically, because we're all about innovation but at the center of innovation has to be equity. Absolutely. We have to plan for equity because if we're not deliberate in our planning, what we'll have is an inequitable system. Um, so Adam, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the relationships between vision loss and how that impacts patients and their quality of life? Sure. Um, I, I think this is a situation in which patients need to know that, that you care before they care what you know. And a lot of times doctors jump right into, you need to do this, you need to do that, make sure you go here, make sure you go to this appointment, go here, there, and the other. But they haven't gotten to know the patient to understand it took them three buses to get to you. What you're asking is not on the same bus line as them. Um, they watch their kids during the day, you know, like different, you know, they watch their grandkids during the day, you know, different things like that that if the, the provider actually would ask those questions when you're making those referrals, the patient would understand that, hey, I took that into consideration and we looked at the bus routes, 
we found the place that was going to is going to allow you to do this is going to allow you to do that this actual provider i'm sending you to has a van and they're willing to pick you up that makes the patient really want to make that appointment really want to do that follow-up mm -hmm. um when you're talking to the patient kind of find out what their activities of daily livings are what do they actually need because sometimes you can make oh i i made it great for this and i made it great for that but she's like well i don't really watch tv and i don't drive i I want to read my Bible mm -hmm. um, and you haven't fixed that part. Um, you know, we're telling them, do you have a large print Bible? Do you have large print font? What if we got you an audible subscription for $10 a month where you could listen to the books, even though we can't do things to help you be able to see the books. What if you could actually listen to the content and now you're actually hearing the author and you could hear, you know, uh, Michelle Obama, instead of just reading her book, you could listen to her voice. And that, you know, that that little lady would just light up and be like, oh, I could listen to Michelle. That would be so nice. And now she has stopped thinking about her vision loss and looked at it as a person and realized that I'm seeing you as a person. And I think that's what's missing from my healthcare uh, system is that that personal care, that personal touch, that real connection that goes beyond the numbers and realizing what does this person actually need? What can I do to make their day better? What can I do to make the, their quality of living better? Even if we've done everything, her pressure's as low as it's gonna be, there's nothing I can do about that. But what if I could do this? Mm -hmm. What if I could do that? Um, and then all of a sudden they realize the care and concern you have and the compassion you have, and all the other stuff starts to work. All mm -hmm. the other stuff starts to pay attention, they pay attention to it because they show up to their appointments because, oh, that's my doctor. Oh, I love my doctor. When you get a patient that says, I love my doctor, that patient is going to follow what you're saying. When you ask a patient what your doctor's name is and they can't tell you the doctor's name, that's a patient that's probably going to miss their appointments. That's a patient that's probably not going to take their medication. That's a patient that's not going to be there. So I think the, the connection between vision loss and, and what's going on has to do with that personal touch. And once you get down to the, the root of those things, we can actually begin to solve the problems in minority communities. You know, that is so helpful um, to think about uh, for, for several reasons, um, addressing people's humanity um, and their, their specific circumstances. Not only does that show that you care and sort of, like you said, um, help open up the space for um, more bonding with a patient and patient adherence to the treatment plan, but it actually allows you to address some of these social determinants of health that may be barriers to them accessing the care that you want them to have anyway. So it's like a twofer. You're you're addressing the needs, but you're also by doing so showing that you care and helping to establish rapport. I think that was a really an excellent point that you made. Thank you. So Ruth, this is, uh, this is excellent. You had mentioned um, something about missed opportunities. Can you tell us a little bit about um, populations that are more likely to have missed opportunities amongst uh, kids? Sure. So, you know, research tells us that um, underrepresented um, populations, so um, Black children, um, Latinx children, they tend to have less access and therefore are not getting the care that they need um, as their peers are. And so, we see in these populations, they have three times the odds of reporting poor subjective visual function. They have two times the odds of presenting with digital acuity that's worse than 2040. And for us, that now gets into um, amblyopia or some would call that lazy eye. And again, a lot of the times these things are, are, are fixable. We can remedy the situation with glasses, with patching, very kind of low tech um, interventions, if you will. Um, and we also see the same kind of statistics in low income um, households, which there's often a crossover between minority households and low income households. And these um, groups of people are also reporting um, poor visual function. So yeah, when I when I say missed opportunity, the, the numbers are there, the research is there that supports there are children, particularly children in, in specific populations that require this care and intervention. And we really have to do a better job of figuring out how to get it to them. So Adam, what tools or treatments do we have and what are our goals in optimal vision care for our patients? Well, you know, sometimes as optometrists, we can sometimes overlook some simple things. So getting the patient the proper glasses and the proper prescription or contacts or referring them out for different surgeries, whether it be glaucoma surgery or cataract surgery, 
uh, may be the first start at the new uh, lease on life that they need for their health. But sometimes that's just not enough. So uh, Dr. Ramsey turns into the IT director. So I will ask the patients, can I see your phone? Mm -hmm. And I will enlarge their font. I will increase the brightness on their screen. And you'll be surprised these, 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 these patients are like, I didn't know how to do that. And I'm like, look, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> you just slide down and you can increase the brightness. Like, oh, now, because they'll come in and say, I can't see this and I can't see that. And I'll look at their phone and I'm like, well, you have it on 20% brightness. It's dark. Like, of course, you're not going to see it without changing anything. I just increased the brightness. Oh, I can see it now. Mm -hmm. It's not a glasses issue. But sometimes mm -hmm. those are the simple little things on getting on, on getting down on the getting down on the ground and getting with the patient and getting to their level and say, well, let me not just do it for you, but let me show you how to do it. Yes. And I get in there and say, click this and go to settings and you can make the font bigger. And you hit this little thing right here. And all of a sudden, the glasses that weren't working for them or their vision after cataract surgery that wasn't working for them with increased brightness, increased font size, all of a sudden they can see better. So, you know, from, from, from a patient's perspective, finding out what they actually need, finding out where, where they are and, and, you know, are they willing to wear the glasses? If they're not willing to wear the glasses and you gave them a great prescription, but when they walk out of your office, they won't put them on. This is where I, I ask the patients, I ask the kids, and I say, is your, does your dad wear glasses? Oh, he never wears those glasses. So what he's talking about when he says he can't see is without the glasses. He's not talking about with the glasses on, mm -hmm. right? So asking the right questions and get in there. Sometimes I'll even go to a patient and say, can you buy your mom an iPad? And then she's able to read on instead of a phone screen, because some of them have those little cute small phones or mm -hmm. a flip phone. And I'm like, that's not going to work. I'm sorry. I'm not a magician. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. But could you get your mom an iPad? Well, oh, yeah. I had a patient say, oh, well, the sisters will, you know, team up our money. We'll get her a tablet and be able to then see uh, appropriately. And now all of a sudden her world opens back up and her quality of life and her, her peace within her current health situation is not so stressful anymore. Um, and sometimes that's all it really takes is meeting them where they are. What yeah. do you have? And asking the kids, do you have an iPad that you're not using or a tablet you're not using anymore? Well, yeah, I got one. I, I'm, I'm not using it. Well, can your mom get it so that she can do X, Y, and Z? And all of a sudden now their world is much, uh, much better. Um, and we've actually met them at the disease state. And we're actually treating them appropriately all the way through, not just prescribing the drops, not just putting them on vitamins, but figuring out what goes past that for that patient. No, I love that you have activated the entire family or social support system around this specific patient, um, because we think about that for chronic diseases like diabetes. Um, but, uh, you know, asking the, the real truth tellers, the kids, you know, my son is always telling way too much truth. And so, um, you know, bringing that, taking that same family-based approach to eye care, I think is really important. So thank you for bringing that up too. Um, both Adam and Ruth, tools, treatment, and goals are important, and I'm glad we have so many options, um, but they're not really useful um, for disparities prevention or our patients if we can't have access to them or utilize them. So I want us to shift our conversation to educating our audience on easy things that they can do to improve the care of our underserved patients and all patients. Um, and Adam, you've been talking about that sort of throughout the uh, uh, our session today, but can we cover a, a little, uh, cover the, those areas a little bit more in detail for our audience? Sure. So some small changes that clinicians can start making today is simply asking questions and asking um, about the social determinants of health that uh, their patient might be experiencing in terms of accessibility. Do they have transportation to get to their provider easily? or do they need some support in that way? Do um, they have social supports that can help them if they can't really do things um, on, the, on their own, such as obtaining the glasses or picking up medications and things of that nature? Um, so really just thinking about holistically all the factors that um, determine whether a patient is even able to get to your office and then subsequently able to manage the treatment plan that you've laid out for them. So. You know, don't be afraid to ask about these questions. You know, sometimes people think, well, it's not really any of my business what a, a patient's home life is, but it is our business because all of those factors are going to affect um, um, treatment outcomes and continuing these disparities that we're seeing. We also want to consider comorbid factors. So 
are, is obesity an issue with their patient? Do they have autoimmune disorders? Do they smoke? Do they drink? Do they do recreational drugs? Are there things that we should be asking um, about as well as involving the appropriate providers in the care of these patients? So, you know, not only do we have to communicate with our patients better, but we also have to communicate with all the providers involved. And eye care absolutely has to have a seat at the table because we really shouldn't see people going blind that are going blind because most of these things are preventable, sometimes even reversible with the proper care. And I also feel like, uh, you know, asking the right questions is, is, is important. You know, I think of an example of I had a patient that I was sharing with another uh, provider and they, they came to me and they says, I can't use this. And what it was, was a heating mask, but it was something you put in the microwave. And I'm like, why can't you use it? And the person was like, I don't own a microwave. And I didn't think about it, you know, and as a provider, you may prescribe something or give them and tell them to warm it up or read the directions without going through it. But we may make assumptions and the patient said, well, I don't own a microwave. And that's where, you know, separate out to that had another patient in which we were like, okay, it's hard for you to get here. Let's set up a telehealth appointment and then we'll call you and this, that, and the other. But the patient did not have Wi-Fi or services at their, at their home. And this is where asking the right questions and we were able to set them up with, they had a local provider where nonprofit that will provide Wi-Fi in people's homes at low or no cost to them. But this is where I got my whole office involved. So it, it went beyond just me. And I went to the front desk and I says, can you set them up with this service? And can you find out about this? And we passed their information along to get them Wi-Fi. And then we found the other uh, patient, a uh, dry eye mask that you could actually heat up in, in hot water instead of, um, and it was one that you just break and then you heat it up and you can put it in just hot water that they did on the stove to, to re-engage the dry eye mask so they'd ac actually do the services that were uh, that were prescribed to them. But that's where you got to ask the right questions and go beyond. You know, telehealth and all that stuff is good if the person has access to a computer, has access to a phone that has those services on there. Do they have Wi-Fi that it's, that's dependable? Um, so, you know, uh, finding out where the patient is and let's say, let's meet them where they are because we can add in all these telehealth, we can add in all this greatest technology, but if the technology is really expensive and they can't utilize it, or if there is a, a barrier that they can't get over themselves and they really sometimes are embarrassed to ask, mm -hmm. sometimes don't know the right questions to ask, sometimes you know they make assumptions and they you get home and they can't actually do it and they're like, well, I came all the way over here, I bought this thing and I can't, I can't use it, it's too cumbersome. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had a patient that they lived in a two-story home. The microwave was downstairs, but we're telling them to do the dry eye mask before they go to bed. And the lady says, listen, it's a lot of work for me to get up my steps. So by the time I get up my steps, I can't actually heat up the, the mask. So, you know, finding ways to get over those hurdles for the patient is really important. And you just have to ask the right questions and then we're able to integrate it into their lifestyles. Mm -hmm. I know that your patients love coming to see you. Um, it <laughs> sounds like you have really captured the ability to think about technology and innovation, but like you said, meeting people where they are and really understanding their barriers and being willing to address them in a way that is respectful um, and doesn't feel um, like it would be stigmatizing in any way. And that that is really what we would want for all of our patients um, everywhere. So I just hat tip to you for, for all of the work that you do, um, both of you. Um, what are some other questions that maybe we should all be asking our patients to be able to get to um, uh, issues that we need to resolve before they leave the office? So great question. Um, some simple questions to add um, either at the beginning of your, your appointment with the patient or towards the end is, um, one, do, do they have challenges even getting to your appointment? So that addresses transportation needs, that addresses social support needs. Um, do they have access to a pharmacy that they regularly see? Because again, we want to establish consistency um, and good continuity of care. So having these in our EHRs or EMRs so that we know where a patient is going to get their medications or do they have a preferred provider on where to get their glasses if that's something that your office doesn't provide. 
um, being able to provide care in a preferred language. And this is now we're getting into a realm where maybe a practice has to put forth a little bit more effort to really um, be user-friendly to the patient. Is your um, intake forms in a language that your patient can understand? Or do you have language access services, which is something that we should all really strive to have um, and through the use of technology. So that's one of the things that technology I think does really well is provide language access services in a variety of la uh, languages that you can access either via phone or via video. Um, asking the patient if they are um, in safe housing. Um, do they have orientation and mobility issues? Do they use a cane or walker? A lot of that can come from observations because they may very well say they don't need it. And we've all had perhaps elder people in our lives that say, I don't need that cane. Nevertheless, they're bumping into both sides of the walls as they're, as they're walking down the hallway. So really being able to be a good observer and be a holistic clinician to really identify or ask more questions in order to see um, how we can intervene to really provide the best overall care for our patients, um, starting with the vision. But vision is just, is part of the whole ecosystem of health. Yes, absolutely. So now we have some great questions that we can ask our patients. Um, how do we as providers address this issue of access to treatment? What can we do differently? Um, and maybe Ruth, you can, break, you can briefly sort of cover, the, uh, cover these, this for us. Sure. So I think I started to mention just putting a little bit more effort in. So some of the things that we had talked about earlier are a little bit more passive, maybe asking more questions, but really uh, addressing some of the structural needs. Now we're getting into um, language access services. And really anybody who's taking federal dollars, and that's Medicare and Medicaid, you are actually required by law to provide language access services for your patients. And so just um, taking a, a inventory of the population that you serve, even just seeing what are the common, maybe common two or three languages outside of English that your the population in your community speaks and addressing those needs could be a great start. Having user-friendly intake forms, are you allowing people to identify by the pronouns that they want to identi be identified by, um, by the ethnicity that they prefer and race that they prefer to be identified by? Um, or not? Are you and your practice engaging in um, unconscious bias um, training so that we can learn these things that we have, these biases that we have that do unfortunately trickle into our clinical care experience? And it's, it's, it's ubiquitous. Not one person in practice can say that they're an unbiased individual, including myself. And so having that awareness and engaging in training and workshops, even basic conversations, calling somebody and talking something through, getting maybe over the initial embarrassment or shame you might have associated with some of those biases as you become aware of them um, can really make a difference in how you ultimately interact with your patients. So um, just kind of to summarize, language access services, creating a user-friendly um, practice, having intake forms that are user-friendly, having staff that's reflective of the community that you're serving that could maybe bridge the gaps with some of those languages and ongoing um, bias awareness training, I think are some of the structures that we can put in place to address these disparities. Adam, when we were developing the activity, you said something that I believe is worth repeating. When uh, discussing the current glasses market, you noted things that are made for everybody are made for nobody. Can you talk a little bit more about what that means? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, when my patients go out into the optical, I want them to feel like the glasses were designed for them with them in mind. Um, you know, cur the current eyewear market, they, they make it just universal. It's for everybody. And then you have a global fit. So Asians have their own actual eyewear lines and then everybody else is supposed to fit into one in one box. And I think that's unfair. Um, people that do not fit in the, the, the medium sized frame are asked to extend the temples or widen out the, the, the temples of the frames or try and adjust it, but it hits their face. It hits the sides, the sides of their temples. Um, and I feel like that's, that's not appropriate. You know, we would never tell people to get clothes that are for men and women, universal clothes. 
<laughs> no, they are stuff that are for women and they're stuff for men. So mm -hmm. there are stuff for people with uh, larger eye sizes and there's stuff with petite eye sizes. So we need to actually be more uh, appropriate to the, the patients and their communities. And I think a lot of times minorities are left out because mm -hmm. we need larger eye sizes. We need longer temples. Our cheeks stick out a little bit more. So the glasses push into our, our face. Where we're not able to see clearly. Um, and the glasses have to be affordable. They have to be able to meet the patients where they are. We can't say the ones that are for minority uh, populations cost three times as much. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that, that, that is not the answer. Um, and we have to be able to find ways to meet patients uh, where they are and uh, be more specific to them in, in their communities. Yes, thank you so much for that. Um, Ruth, as a clinical professor of optometry and vision science, you interact with students and faculty all the time. Where do things stand with provider education in vision care and what should we be focusing on moving forward? Uh, provider education, so um, educating our future providers, I'm assuming that's what you're, you're getting to, so our, our students that are currently enrolled and our future students to come. I think taking a hard look at the curriculum, what we're teaching and how we're teaching is really going to be what is a driving change in the education of our future providers. And so part of the things that I'm working on is infusing the curriculum with information about health disparities, information about oppression and what happens in marginalized communities, information about anti-racism and how to be an anti-racist um, so that we can create this curriculum where students are now getting this information that they can use practically when they're in the clinic as students seeing patients as well as when they graduate because it's something that's not been done before. It's either figure it out yourself or you continue with the practices that we've always learned, which are damaging and which is why we have these disparities in the first place. So really reforming the curriculum is um, a big part of what is needed to change in our education. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so you're both involved in some wonderful initiatives to promote equity and equality in vision care. Um, care to provide a little bit more information about the kind of work that you're doing? Can you just sort of briefly talk about some examples? Well, um, I co-founded uh, Black Eye Care Perspective with Dr. Daryl Glover, um, and one of our major initiatives is the 13% Promise, in which we're trying to get schools, institutions, corporate entities, uh, individual uh, practicing doctors to understand that we would like the um, percentage of uh, black optometrists to reflect the U.S. Census. So from the information we saw on the previous slide, uh, we are not there. Um, and we named the organization Black Eye Care Perspective because we needed a direct uh, solution for a direct problem. And as you can see from the previous slide, if we just says we want to get minorities increased, well, that's not the problem because not all minorities are being underrepresented. So we needed to actually focus on saying why, what's going on in the Black community and what can we do to alleviate those issues? Um, so the 13% promise was there to say 1% of the time, we want to increase the numbers and create a pipeline for black students into the optom optometric profession. Excellent. Yeah. And so for me, I, I currently serve as the chair of the Diversity and Cultural Competency Committee, which is part of ASCO, the Association of Schools of Colleges of Optometry. And so we um, have been working really hard recently um, to help promote racial and ethnic diversity and inclusion initiatives within our optometric institutions. And so this is aimed primarily at uh, faculty and students in terms of um, increasing our application numbers, particularly the diversity of our, application, of our applicants. And so over the past uh, couple of years in particular, we hosted town halls, we are currently working on um, a speaker series, which is, um, our, is sponsored by Johnson & Johnson. And so we thank them for their, sponsor, their sponsorship. And so we've just really been working to get this information into the hands of educators, um, including updating our cultural competency guidelines, creating workshops that people will have access to, and creating a learning management system where all of this information will be, live and people can um, continue to access it over time. Excellent. 
thank you so much to both of you for the work that you're all doing to increase equity um, and for this fantastic discussion. Um, let me put today's discussion into actions that we can all do to provide more equitable vision care. Um, and then you guys can let me know if I've missed anything. Uh, first, identify potential cultural or language barriers. Second, ask patients if they foresee any barriers to accessing treatment, follow-up appointments, medication and treatment adherence, et cetera. Third, assess each patient's potential disparities during the treatment planning process, including unconscious bias, prior health care experiences, social determinants of health, age of the onset of vision difficulties, their occupation, comorbidities, and health literacy as some examples. Uh, fourth, educate patients to minimize inequities in vision health care and promote health literacy. And then finally, integrate all members of the care team to develop a holistic action plan with individualized SMART goals for all patients. Anything else that I missed, that Adam and Ruth, that you want to add? No, I think that was a great summary. And just to um, explain SMART goals, which are important, and I like to add SMART-T, so SMART being specific, measurable, measurable, attainable, relevant, timely. The IE is um, addressing uh, equity. Thank you. I love that. I've not heard it before, but smart E, that's perfect. Again, I really just want to thank you all both, Dr. Adam Ramsey and Dr. Ruth Shoge, for joining me today um, and for reminding our audience that you can join me here for more CME podcasts that are wonderful, just like this one, for live webinars, case discussions, and more, including an upcoming CMEL beef case in vision care. You can find out about all of the upcoming live events and view previous ones on the DNI Hub at the link here. So here are just some of the topics that we've covered so far, and we'll be adding new content every month. We really wanna hear from you, our audience, on what we need so that we can make an impact on these important issues. So please email us at questions at cmeoutfitters.com with your comments and feedback. We assure you we read every email and we really do appreciate this feedback. So please remember uh, to collect credit for your activity today by using the apply for credit button that's on your screen. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Ramsey, Dr. Shoge for your input today. Thank you to our audience for all your work in providing equitable and holistic care to patients around the globe. Have a wonderful day.